Grab your Bibles, church, and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. It has been four or five weeks since we have been here together in the book, and uh, we're back at it. We're looking at part four of our series titled Apostasy or Reality. Where are you? Hebrews chapter 10 demands that you examine yourself to determine if, in fact, you are an actual true believer. I am convinced that there are more people today walking around this world, including in America, including California, that believe that they're on their way to heaven when in fact they're not. They have a judgment system in which they have somehow met the standard. They haven't murdered anybody. They vote or they've never had a parking ticket. And so because of that, they're somehow acceptable to be entered or uh, received into heaven. Assumption can kill you. And you better not be assuming that you're going to be going to heaven. And uh, this is a very timely portion of scripture. Not only for the age and the time in which we're in, because I'm struggling, as I told you on Sunday, I want to teach Bible prophecy right now. We're going to do it soon with all that's going on. But at at the same time, I, I need to make sure that you and I are ready to meet the Lord at any moment. And so we're sticking right now to the doctrine of where God has us. But I'm telling you, I'm going to speak faster than I normally do, and I'm going to try to cover more ground than I normally do, because I don't know how much time we have to get out all that we need to get out, because we're living in very extreme but awesome moments in human history, in church history. And so when we left off last time, we were looking at a very serious exhortation uh, in this chapter 10. Uh, that we need to make sure that we are rerooted in all of these things. First of all, in a little bit of a backup, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, um, I just want to read this to you. You can follow along. He said, the author, uh, of how much more punishment do you suppose will he, somebody, anybody, be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? If you, if you refuse Moses, uh, and that's bad enough, What's going to happen to you if you refuse Christ? So watch. Trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant, which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. Verse 30. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Verse 31. This is where we ended. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, I told you before, my opinion is that this is a Pauline epistle. I have my reasons to believe that Paul wrote it. It's not important. If God the Holy Spirit wanted us to know that it was Paul, he would have put Paul at the front of it. The book's got no ascribed author to it. But that's beside the point. But when you hear him, the, the, the writer of this book, say that it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. It is a statement from a believer to believers that we need to realize, and this is a tough sell in in the 21st century, that we need to realize that we are aliens in this world. This is no longer our home, that this globe is condemned to destruction, and that Christ came, died on the cross, rose again from the dead to redeem out from this fallen world his own, and that heaven is forever, and the fact of the matter is that God's judgment is terrifying. It's terrifying. And it's not only terrifying, obviously, for the non-believer, but when he says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, he's talking about not only those who have denied Christ, but for you and I to someday stand before Christ is going to be a terrifying moment. The Bible teaches, how many of you are Christians? Raise your hands. Every single one of us who are Christians will stand before Jesus and give an account for ourselves in this life, face to face, with the one who angels shielded their face from. You and I are going to stand there. And you say, wait a minute, that's terrifying. It sure is. Absolutely. Now, that's not a meeting with Jesus that's going to determine your salvation, That's already been determined if you've come to Christ. That's done. It is a judgment of Christ evaluating the opportunities that we had, that he sent us, and what did we do with them? Did we blow them off, squander them, or did we take those opportunities and even advance them 
for his name. So church, a lot of preparation before we get going. John chapter 3, verse 14. Everybody knows John 3, 16. So, oh yes, I just love that. You need to remember where the context of John 3, 16 is embedded. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, if you remember that, even so must the son of man, Jesus is saying, be lifted up. Now, in that statement, Jesus just announced to Nicodemus, and for that matter, to the whole world, that the Son of Man is going to be crucified. To be lifted up in those days meant to be lifted up, that is crucified, and that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Most people stop reading there. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him, that's Christ Jesus, is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. That's humans, that is the the default status of the human. Because, why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil, and they love it. You and I know people today that love their sin. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light... Why? Because they're one and the same, really. That his deeds may be clearly seen, that they, may, that they have been done in God. Very powerful and poignant statement. Oh, we just love John 3, 16. Just know this. The giving of the gospel is awesome to those who receive it. The giving of the gospel is terrifying to those who reject it. They just don't know that yet. And uh, one more before we look at some of these points from the past. And that is um, something that should just grieve us tremendously. And that is 2 Peter 2, verse 20. This This is so powerful. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. What is he saying in verse 20? There are those, listen, listen, judge yourself right now. Don't judge anybody else, judge you. There are those who can recite the gospel, they could preach the gospel, they could write books about the gospel, they could share the gospel with other people. They just have no effect of the gospel in their own life. That's who verse 20 is. They didn't lose their salvation. They had the knowledge of it, but they were never saved. Jesus said in Matthew 7, somewhere around verse 20, 21, 22, that there's going to be people in the day of judgment that are going to announce, I did miracles in your name. I preached, I I, I cast out demons in your name. And Jesus said, I don't even know who you are. Depart from me into everlasting fire. Don't assume. And when he says in verse 21... For it would have been better for them to, uh, not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. That's terrifying, is it not? Very sobering. You say, I came to church tonight to get beat up. No, no, no. If you're a believer tonight, it's like, yes. Granted, it's white knuckle, yes. But maybe you're here tonight and you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is terrifying. Hey, that's okay. Do something about it. Right? God wants you in heaven. Now, listen, this is going to be kind of awkward as we uh, go into this, but we have to before we touch on tonight. This is what we looked at before. And in verse 29, we looked at, are you aware of what's at stake? And so you want to make sure in your own life that you are not one of those who are trampling underfoot uh, the Son of God. That is that you're not, listen, you're not telling people you're a Christian, but you're living a non-Christian life. If you say, oh, I know Jesus, the question we should say is, Does Jesus know you? And that's a very important thing. 
Because religion can get you into a setting whereby you think you're okay. Even morality. Look, religion's fine if it's focused rightly. Morality's fine if it's focused rightly. But it can't do anything about your eternal soul, according to the scripture. An actual, intimate relationship with God is what is required. And when that word, and we looked at it one, uh, together, it was one word trampled underfoot, and just quickly, it means to just go back and forth with your own body weight. It's that of your own body, to go back and forth and trample the doctrines of God, the sacrifice of Christ, the cross, the blood, the resurrection. You know all about it, but your lifestyle just tramples on it. He's warning you that's not going to work. We also learned in verse 29 that what are you going to do about it? When you learn about this, that you hate hypocrisy, every one of us hates hypocrisy. And what's really funny, I don't even know this or not, you know, you know what level of hypocrisy I can't stand the most? It's the one that I'm guilty of. Did you know that's true psychologically with you as well? You, let's, you have a tendency to find something in somebody and call it out. Or if you don't call it out, you're inside going, how could they? Do you know how you identified it? You're, the reason why you saw it in them, you know the old saying, this is the old saying that actually where it comes from. Well, when you point at somebody, there's three fingers pointing back. Is that right, three? Yeah, I don't think my thumb would go back that far. There's three, you point one, there's three fingers pointing back at you. Well, you know, that's something you hear in the schoolyard, but it's actually theologically accurate. The way that you find out something that drives you nuts about someone else in the realm of hypocrisy, the reason why you identify or you catch it is because you're familiar with it. You see yourself in them and you hate it. Isn't that funny? And so what you want to do is, oh, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, and, and we don't need to look at others. We need to present ourselves to him. And that we're invited to do something about it. And that is that we are to go to the spirit of grace and seek him. And so, church, I'm going to ask you, if you would now, to stand as we read together. I'll read verse 32. If you read the odd-numbered verses, Hebrews chapter 10. I heard some of you gro moaning, groaning when you were getting up. <laughs> I heard people standing up. It's been a long day. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. For you had compassion on me. See, this is why I think it's Paul. For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully ex accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. For you have need of endurance. So that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Lord, come now. Now, the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe in the saving of the soul. Wow, and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. So in verse 32, and moving on, down to verse 34, we acknowledge this. When we talk about apostasy and the reality and where are you, where am I in this, we want to look at verses 32 and 33 that we just read now and understand this in your note-taking that we need to be strengthened, and we need to strengthen those things that remain in our lives. Take stock, take inventory as a believer. And why am I saying this? Because we'll see in a moment that Scripture encourages us to do this, but let's us all be honest right now for the furtherance of the gospel and God's sanctification work in our lives. You and I are normal human beings, which means even in our Christian relationship with God, we 
I would trust anyway, are very honest with the Lord in our hearts and minds and when we speak to the Lord. It would be really futile. I almost used the word stupid, but that's not an acceptable word. So it's futile for you to think that you're fooling God. Just be honest with them. Talk to him. But when we relate to one another, there's, there's this thing where, uh, and you know, sorry, but this is true. When Christians say to other Christians, how you doing? They don't really intend for you to tell you how you're actually doing. That's, a, that's just a way of saying hi with a little bit more of an external love. Hey, how you doing? That's a big hint, by the way. When somebody goes, hey, how you doing? <laughs> uh, but externally, uh, we're not honest enough. And uh, we should be. We cannot touch this portion of scripture without being honest enough. Because the author just said a moment ago, hey, thank you for being with me, so to speak, spiritually, right? You've endured my chains and you've endured yourself. You've been brought under a lot of attack. He's hinting that you've been brought under attack because of your, your association with me. That's powerful. And he's basically saying thank you. Well, how honest is that? I love that. Church family, we need to grow up and get beyond this superficial veneer that everything's good all the time, everything's fine. It's false, it's discouraging, it's not real, and we all know it. Now, here's the funny thing about it, because Satan's a really good devil. He's the best devil they'll ever be. He whispers to you, and he tells you how bad of a Christian you are. He's the first one to remind you how little you pray. He's the first one to tell you how little Bible reading you do. He's the first one to say, you heard the pastor. You're supposed to share the Lord. How many people have you led to Christ this week? Why should God, lead, why should God let you into heaven? He's always putting stuff in your head, and he does it in such a way that you don't think it's in anybody else's head. But he's an equal opportunity tempter. And he's very good at it. And I've noticed in this day and age, a lot of people are getting, what, punched in the stomach. The wind is getting knocked out of them, spiritually speaking. I want to tell you right now, cheer up. I got to tell you, listen, things like this, and this is just a scratch in the surface, but may this encourage you. I don't, I don't vent my laundry in front of you guys, and I tell our pastors not to share our laundry in front of you guys because you've got enough burdens. We need to come to you and minister to you, and we minister to one another. But you guys know, for example, those of you who are here even before COVID, uh, six or seven times I attempted to resign from this church because of my insomnia was killing me. My brain was shrinking because I wasn't producing serotonin. The, the moisture levels had reached a critical state. Many of you remember this. I missed two and a half months of pulpit time because I could barely put one foot in front of the other. I went to five great specialists until I went to the number one sleep specialist in America. And at the end of it all, the guy said, there's nothing I can do for you. I've got, I, I'm the most prestigious man in the nation on sleep disorders, and you're actually bad for my business because I can't do a thing for you. I don't know what's wrong with you. As soon as that expert said it, I knew it was a spiritual event. It went on for two and a half years. Why? Six months before that insomnia began to relax or to calm down or relieve, whatever it's called, dissipate. COVID hit. And what happened after COVID or during COVID? This church exploded here and beyond to the ends of the earth. Why did that happen? Now I can look back. I can look back now. I was gutted for two and a half years. You want to talk about weak? I never came out here to tell you how weak I was. I never told you that when I got done several Sundays and I would drive home, I couldn't get home. I couldn't remember how to get home. Get home. I got in my driveway one day and I parked, and I don't remember how long I was sitting in the car parked in the driveway, but it had been almost an hour. I didn't know where I was. I hadn't slept one time for 72 hours. I called a U.S. Navy SEAL that I know, and I said, what do you guys do? I know that you have 72-hour deployments. How do you do it? 
I've got to know how to stay up. I'm sick. I've got a fever. I'm, I'm about ready to throw up. I've been up for 72 hours. He said, here's the, here's the problem. He said, I'm 24 years old. <laughs> and he said, when we stay up for 72 hours, we're, we're vomiting. We're sick for about three days afterward. He said, you're 60 something. And he said, I don't know. I don't know what to say to you. The bottom line was this. God had to do that to me. Because when COVID hit and this church was catapulted to the front of the line and we saw what God was doing and is still doing, none of Jack could be living anymore. Does that make sense to you? Now I can look back and say, do it again, Lord. Just do it again. If that's what you do, if that's what you do to do something in our lives, do it again. And God has been faithful all these years to do those things. Strengthen the things that remain. All I had left in those days was to lean on my wife, who God gave her as a helpmate to me from the beginning, and to, frankly, live off of prayer. Because when you have insomnia severely, you can't read. Did you know that? I listen to so many sermons, you can't open your eyes. They just burn so bad. Oh, well, if you can't sleep, I bet you you can crank out a lot of sermons then. No, you can't read because your eyes are on fire, your brain hurts, you can't remember a thing. So I lived by the prayers of others and by the faithfulness of my wife ministering to me. And listen, all that turns out for the good. We've been later on that in Romans. It turned out for the good. I wouldn't change a thing. Why am I saying this? Because we need to strengthen those things that remain. You might be here tonight and you might be watching right now. You're thinking, that's it. It's over. I lost my job. A lot of people are losing their jobs right now. There's seven and a half million open jobs in this nation and people are getting messed with in their jobs i'm hearing about it so much where you know what we're doing we're firing christians and you can call your attorney and you can go go tell hr they're gonna laugh in your face they're in on it we're firing all of our christians that work at this company they're just blatantly saying it lawlessness the god in heaven is watching this you're not alone in this you're not on your own god is doing something Hey, listen, in this way, he's bringing you through your insomnia trip or whatever it might be. It's going to be something. What are you going through? You raised your hand a moment ago. You, you, you announced publicly that you're a Christian. He will not abandon you. But he will say to us, strengthen the little bit that you have, strengthen it. Focus on what is true. And so church, look at this. Verses 32 to 33. Remember when he first came to you in your life? Now, I need to preface this. I can tell you almost to the minute when Christ invaded my life. But if you ask Lisa, she can't tell you that. She was born and raised in a godly home. She can't tell you the day she accepted Christ. She's not even sure the year she accepted Christ. She's always known Jesus. But she, she remembers a time where she had kind of backslidden away from the Lord and rededicated her life. So maybe you're here tonight, and you're saying, I, I, I don't know when he met me. I've, I've always known him. God bless you. You are one of those people that's a testimony of the keeping power of God. Well, I don't have a testimony, though. Everybody's got, they murdered their cat. They murdered their cow. They shot, you know, I, they're, you, they're muggers and, and, and gang members, and they came to Christ. The sky opened up, and a Bible hit them in the head. I don't have that testimony. You're not supposed to have that testimony. That's for those guys and gals. Listen, we all have our testimony, though. If you know Jesus, you have a testimony. You can tell people. By the way, that is your witnessing tool, is tell people what God has done in your life. If you don't have a story, then you don't have a story. And if you don't, it's because you need him. As believers, we need to strengthen those things that remain, and that is to remember to go back. The Old Testament's full of this, where the patriarchs would go back to those places and restack the stones and resacrifice from the beginning. Go back and remember. I want to ask you, go back now. Can you remember when Christ first came to you? And I'm struggling now because we need to stay away from the organized church Wednesday night policy as normal. I know I'm supposed to speak for a certain period of time and I've got to end a certain period of time and I'm supposed to do what I'm doing right now. I, I, I'd rather snap my fingers and have us all sitting around a coffee table right now with no distractions and ask you, can you tell me please, 
I want to hear from you for no reason but to hear about the wonderful works of God. Tell me how he began to work in your life. And you should be able to say, well, you know what? It kind of happened this way. My parents or my dad or my uncle or my boss or my husband or my wife. It happened with my parents. It kind of started like this. Man, on Monday, I, I was, I had, ministry, it's very complicated. Ministry business in Santa Monica. It's very strange. I was called upon to be at a place and look at things from a, give an assessment from a biblical perspective. In this, one person, one person from another country, another person from some other country, and they said, uh, so you're the expert, what, in, in God stuff? Bible stuff? I said, that's why I'm here. And um, one person said, I believe in God, and the other person said, I don't. And we started talking. I was there for some other reason. Started talking. So when somebody says, I don't believe in God, oh, you must have a fantastic reason as to why you don't. Because, you know, most of the world believes in gods or a god or God. So you don't? So I'm fascinated when people say that. I don't believe in God. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, you have to tell me why. This is absolutely fascinating. Why? Why do you not? And this particular person, very bright, kind of just looked at us and what the, the question was asked, why should I believe the Bible? All right. So we, Lisa and I started answering. And I'd never, we had never met these people before. Didn't know we were going to meet them. And you know when God does the work? So this was Monday. I haven't been able to get them out of my mind. I've been praying for them more than anyone else in my life right now since. Why? Because I can't get them out of my mind. The thing is, I don't, I'm not supposed to get them out of my mind. God keeps putting them on my mind. Listen, I don't know, only God knows. But if, if, they, if they give their heart to Christ... I will not be surprised. I will not be surprised. Why? Because that conversation went back to, I remember this when I was young. I remember this when I was being brought up. I remember being told this about no God or a God. Are you with me? When we go back and we revisit those places that God has moved in our lives, it's very powerful. He says in verse 32, but recall the former days in which... After you were illuminated, you knew. He's speaking here to the believer now. He's not talking about those who've trampled the foot of, uh, under their feet the, the blood of Christ. He's talking to the believer now. And he's saying, go back and recall the former days. Go back. It's always good to look back, church, at the right things. And you, need, you and I need to control our thinking. Will we all agree on that, everybody? We all need to hear that? Are you and I prone to go to a dark place in our mind if we relax our, our cables? I mean, for me, it's cables, concrete, and structures in my mind. My past, you'll never know about it. God is, you know, wow, I just said that, and somebody from my past came to church here last Sunday. We went to high school together. And it's like... <laughs> But you know what? She's not who she is anymore, and I'm not who I am anymore. And isn't it absolutely awesome what God does in a life? And so when you look back at the past, you need to make sure that you do it with self-control. Bring every thought under the captivity of Christ. Why? Because... By nature, darkness pulls on our depression or pulls on our sins that are gone or pulls on our whatever it was and the enemy tries to pull you back. You need to stop that and know that's under the blood of Christ. That's gone. Now this about the past is awesome. Church, I cannot explain it. I don't, 
I didn't know anybody. I didn't pay anybody. How did this knucklehead, this person who truly had no access to heaven, who stuttered profusely, God, God wakes my soul up, and in short order, I'm sitting down with Dr. David Hawking in his office asking him to show me how to study the Bible. I just asked him. And I just thought, he know, I love the way he teaches. I'm going to ask him. So I went up and I asked him, can I watch you study the Bible? What's your name? <laughs> I told him my name. Thursday, 10 o'clock. That's all he said. Seriously. And after that, we became lifelong friends. Dr. John Wolverid, one of the greatest theological minds of the 20th century. Called him up in Dallas Theological Seminary. I was teaching a class at a Bible college and I asked him, can we end, can we end the year with you coming to our class? And he came from Dallas. And then he wound up speaking at this church, I think four times. Tim LaHaye became a friend. Tim LaHaye's the one that says, you need to write books. And I said, that's not for me. He said, it's not for me either. He said, I just walk around with a tape recorder. He says, you need to write. And he was a dear encouragement. Of course, Chuck Smith was my pastor. I've never had any other pastor but Chuck Smith. What are you going to do you know, when Pastor Chuck Smith died? What are you going to do your pastor died? Well, he cannot come to me, but I shall go to him. <laughs> uh, you know, you don't replace him. He was one of the greatest disciple makers ever. And so, uh, and he was so gracious to us and to this church. But um, Dr. Ed Heinsohn, we became such friends that we uh, shared in each other's home. Uh, remarkable. These, these I'm, I'm sure I'm missing some people, which is, you know, how can I miss some of these giants? But the point is this. I never set any of that up. God did all that. And listen, for you to sit there and say, well, you know, look at you. You kind of like born like a millionaire. You got born spiritually with a silver spoon in your mouth. No, 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 no. I was just so insecure, but yet hungry for the word of God, not knowing what to do, that I had to find out more about this word. And so for me today, in getting this message together for you guys this night, and, and preparing for it and thinking about it, it refreshed my soul. Lord, everything you've done along the way has been amazing. If I focus on the bad stuff, it's all depressing. If I fo focus on the good stuff, all the dark stuff goes away and the victory is there. Strengthen those things that remain in your life. Oh, Jack, there's only a sliver left in my life. If there's only a sliver, remember this. You couldn't have that sliver unless Christ would have met you some point in time in life. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, And to the angel of the church at Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you're dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain, that, you are, that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Get away from what's wrong. Go back to where you began. For some of you tonight, it's time, and I pray that that's what you'll do this evening, is you'll decide tonight, I'm starting over. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to that oak or to that stone or to that place, to that location, and I'm going to recommit. I'm going to give again my vows to God. We need to do that. And it's amazing because it says, but recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, watch what happens. You became a believer. The light turned on. You're in the family. That's great. You mean from here on out, it's just roses and easy going until we eventually go to heaven? No. No. You endured <laughs> a great struggle with sufferings. You remember that, Christian? Do you know that, Christian? Let's remember that. When we sign up to go with Jesus, we sign up to go against this world. We need to, you see, this is so remedial. It is remedial, but many in the church world today struggling with this. 
Hey, man, I thought we were Christians. Everything's going to be great. Is anybody everybody going to like me because I'm a Christian now? Really? I'm not sure what book you read to find that, but... Great struggles, great sufferings. Verse 33 says, Partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations. Now, reproaches and tribulations, church, these are powerful words. Uh, Just for now, we'll just say rejections by people and uh, difficulties people watched you go through. And it's not like they cheered you on. Oh, you can do it. You're a Christian, remember? Your heathen neighbors didn't come out and say, oh, you got cancer and you're a Christian? You'll make it. You believe in God, remember? We don't, but you do, so you go for it. That's not what it means. It means, oh, you got cancer? You're the... You're the one that said, but you believe in God. How could you have cancer? That's what the unbelievers do. And if they're not telling you that, they're thinking it. I thought you wanted me to believe in your God, and look at you now. You're sick. What does that have to do with anything? In fact, it actually gives me more power to say to them, hey, you know right here in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, it says that the believer is going to be made a spectacle through the tribulations and reproaches that they go through. So you're mocking me right now and my sickness just proves the point that God is amazing. Well, how can that be when you're suffering and you're sick? Because I've got Jesus with me. And he told me in advance, if you're going to go through this or if somebody throws a brick at your face because of my name being upon your life, you're blessed. Listen, someone's going to throw a brick at the non-believer's life and they don't, they don't, they're not going to get any blessing. They're going to have to go get stitches. That's all they get. The Christian gets beat up because they're a Christian, and we've got Jesus. The, we don't fit in this world. And is it obvious that the way the world is going, if you feel at home in this world right now, like, oh my gosh, if you walk like to a mall, if you walk into a mall right now, I mean, isn't it empty? I don't know about you. I mean, sometimes I have to go to a mall to get Auntie Anne's pretzels, but... <laughs> She have her own stores publicly around places, but she's a Christian, by the way. I actually bumped into her at DBN. Auntie Anne. You know Auntie Anne Pretzels? She loves the Lord. So what does that do with anything? I don't even know why I brought that up. Oh, walked into the mall. You walk into the mall right now, all the, gla- all the glitz, all the lights and the sounds, the temperature's perfect, all this stuff's good, all, you know, all this. Isn't it incredible? You're looking and you're going... Wow, this is so hollow. This is so empty. This is so dead. All the flash, all the, all the stuff, all the style, and it's dead. Why? Because at this time of church age that you and I live in, heaven is more attractive than ever. This world is growing dim. And so part of that is remembering what the Lord brought you out of, remembering what it was like and where you were when he introduced himself to you. It's absolutely amazing. I absolutely love it. Matthew 4, verse 13. Matthew 4, verse 13 says, And leaving Nazareth, he, Jesus, came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea of Galilee, and the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. That's the tribes that were up in the north. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by uh, Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region in the shadow of death, light has dawned. Verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What happened? People sitting in darkness, people lost, just like you and I used to be. The light of the gospel came, and they began to respond. And the same thing happened to you. And we want, you want to ask, how did that happen? What was going on in my life before that? When did that happen? And where did that happen? These are good things. Remember these things. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. Not sure if we're going to get to our Bible study tonight, really, but Mark chapter 5, verse 1. This is huge, but wonderful. And if you think you've got problems, not only did this guy have problems, but uh, 
man, when we, if we ever get a chance to go back to Israel again in this lifetime, this location is one of my favorite places to teach. It's still completely abandoned. No Jews will go there. It's cursed, and I love it. <laughs> it's cursed by the Jews because they're very superstitious, but Jesus made a special trip. He went out of his way, went across the sea in the boat, got out, did his business, and I don't know, was it five minutes, ten minutes? Was it an hour? It wasn't long. Got back in the boat and went back to Tiberias <laughs> for this. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he, Jesus, had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Verse uh, 3, who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broke in pieces, neither could anyone tame him and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out, cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. The word worship is not the worship you do. This man's body went straight towards Jesus and prostrated himself, went face down. But it's not what you might be thinking. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. And Jesus said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, listen, he... Okay, really? Is it he? I wrote in my notes here, verse 10. Who fell on their face? By, who, who prostrated themselves before Jesus? The man, right? Is the man speaking to Jesus? No, the demons are. Apparently at this moment, one chief demon who says, what, when Jesus says, what is your name? He says, legion for we are many. So Jesus is speaking to the one who's most high-ranking among the demons possessing this individual. He has multiple demons possessing him. And I personally believe that explains a lot of weird stuff that's going on in our world today. People call it mental illness. When I hear the word mental illness, I think 90% of the time it's you know what is So I would circle in your notes... Verse 10, also he, or it, them, or they, right? No. Is it him? Is it him? Is it legion? Is it them or they? Are you tracking with me? It, them, they, begged him, Jesus, earnestly that he would not send them it, them, they, out of the country. Now a large herd of swine, pigs, was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons, wow, no, watch how this is elaborating. The he, them, now it says demons. It's it, them, they. Begged him saying, send us, it, them, they, to the swine that we, it, them they may enter them that is the swine and at once Jesus gave them or it them they <laughs> permission then the listen the unclean spirits it them they right it's singular and plural went out and entered the pigs there were about 2000 and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. There's a reason why demons, by the way, are weird about water. Luke talks about it. That's for another day. So those who fed the swine fled. 
And they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was happened or what had happened. Then they came to Jesus. So these are pig traffickers, <laughs> uh, and, and pork is their business. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the one who had been demon-possessed. It, then they, and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. These are people. These are, these are the owners of the pigs. And those who saw it told them, uh, them how it happened to him and how had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Verse 17, then they began to plead with Jesus to depart from the region. Can you imagine? Jesus, get out of here. You're bad for business. <laughs> and when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed with it, them, they, begged Jesus that he might be with him. What a switch. The moment the guy is no longer demon-possessed, you know what his number one desire is now? I want to be with Jesus. You may not have been demon-possessed before you became a Christian, but you wanted to be with Jesus. Just know this. The Bible records that those who were demon-possessed here wanted to be with Jesus. I think this is beautiful. What did Jesus say? Absolutely. We're growing a church, man. Let's get as many people as possible. You can set up chairs. No, nope, he didn't say that. Jesus said, go home. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. That's what you're supposed to say. That's what I'm supposed to say. To ward off apostasy and apathy and complacency in our lives? The reality is this. What did God do in your life? And this gets sweet. He departed, that is the man, and began to proclaim in Decapolis. Decapolis, Deca, is ten. Polis is cities. This guy went preaching. Well, we, we say preaching. He went and told his testimony, like you and I are to do, in the ten cities. The ten cities were massive Roman cities. And we visit some of those when we go to Israel that are absolutely incredible. And he was the, he was the guy that showed up. And, you, and later on in the book of Acts, 20 years later, you've got strong churches in those cities. And you've got to ask the question, where'd they hear the gospel from? When Paul showed up, they were already believers. When Peter got there, they were already believers. How did that happen? One guy, demon-possessed, and Jesus said, you're not, you're not going with us, you're going home. We're, we're not growing a church, we're growing a ministry life, an organism called the church, not a building. Go home, tell your friends, tell your people. And that guy told the 10 cities. This is, uh, this is awesome. This is a, a beautiful thing. We're so out of time, and this is just so wrong, but... <laughs> But I love, I love how it says in verse 20, and he departed and began to proclaim, watch, all that Jesus had done for him. And here's the best part, three words, and all marveled. And all marveled. I'm going to mark this. We'll pick this up here ne next time. But I want to I wanna just, um, let's, let's just do this. Um, I'm telling you to do something. And so let me be the first one to do it. And this is the poor media people are saying, what is he doing? What is he, what's he doing? Um, I'm not even sure what I'm doing. <laughs> if you have your Bible, grab Mark, uh, go to Mark 7. And I, 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 I'm not sure if this is exactly true. I don't know, remember how it unfolded uh, chronologically, but I can tell you this. The first time I heard Pastor Chuck quote or teach this in Mark's gospel, when he came across it, because I had not read it, I remember crying. And that's a big deal for me because I had friends at church and they were crying. They're singing, they'd sing a song. Somebody, you know, <laughs> that song would be sung. Back in those days, it was, you know, Mustard Seed Faith that'd sing a song and, uh, you know, The Way would sing a song and my friend is crying. And it's like, I'm not, what's he crying about? <laughs> and he's like, oh, God. <laughs> and, and I started to think, what's wrong with me? Have you ever thought that? When somebody's like, Jesus, oh. And it, look, I'm not knocking that. If that. That's wonderful. Remember, Jesus died for our sins, not our personalities. 
But see, I was judging myself thinking, I must be dead. That's how I should be. And I really had a hard time with that for a long time. I didn't, didn't even want to be around that guy because I felt bad all the time. Because the, somebody would read the church announcements and he's like, <laughs> they're talking about Thanksgiving. And it's like, okay, I'm not. It just wasn't me. And then Pastor Chuck came to this. And I flipped. And I flipped. It says in verse 31, again departing from the region of Tyre. Did I tell you the chapter? Seven? March 7, 31. Again departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon. That's Lebanon, by the way. He came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they begged Jesus to put his hands on him. So this guy's got some pretty good friends. The, the guy that's deaf and can't speak, his buddies bring him to Jesus. And they're, they're asking Jesus, put your hands on him. That's a lot of faith. They're expecting Jesus to do something about it. And so Jesus took him aside from the multitude. Listen, I, I've never been deaf, but I had a severe impediment of speech. I stuttered really bad. Do you, do you know anybody who stutters? If you know anybody well who stutters, it's very physically painful. It's very physically, just, if you know somebody who stutters, ask them, when you stutter, is it painful? It's very painful. It's right about here. It feels like, uh, all I can tell you is that it feels like there's a stick that's tied around a bunch of uh, yarn or twine, and it's just being twisted. It's just a very, very difficult thing. And you can feel it. Why am I pointing this out? Because when Jesus took this man away from the crowd, when Jesus took him away from the crowd, I grew up always looking for desolate places <laughs> away from people. Because in those days, in the 60s and 70s, going to school, uh, I was so made fun of for being a stutterer because that was, you know, you're a sitting duck for, the, for team bully. It's just the way it is. From the, from the littlest ages that I thought of, of every possible lie you could think of to stay out of school. It was so severe, the, 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 the peer pressure in the attack was so severe in my life that I used to come home for lunch because we lived very close to the school and I would somehow get ketchup out of the refrigerator and go to the bathroom and I would put it in the toilet and then call my mom and tell her that I was sick and I would rather go to the hospital with, because I've got blood throwing up. It was all a lie. A kid is so terrified at that age to create a situation that would take you to the hospital? Yes! It's better than facing that ridicule at school. The teacher, Miss Franz, literally, stand up on the desk. Read chapter 7, Jack. Oh, yeah. Yep. If you've read the book, Turn Around at Home, nine years old, uh, ninth grade. No, 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 wait, nine. Fourth grade. Is that nine years old? Fourth grade. Six guys in a gang held me down on, a, on the school field, held me down, and systematically urinated on my face. Now, I put that in the book, and the producer, David C. Cook, came back and said, I don't think you want to put that in the book, do you? I said, it happened. We're talking about turning your life around, aren't we? It's in the book. It happened in my life. They said, look, it's your life. We'll leave it in the book. It happened. By the way, I got up from that, ashamed beyond being ashamed, snuck home to get cleaned up so my mom or nobody would see me, and at nine years old, determined, I am going to hurt as many people as I possibly can. I'm telling you right now. I made a decision. The world will pay for this. And from that age on, I began to hurt people by every means possible. Listen, it was like Guido, you know, hey, we got to bump you off. It's not personal. You know those hit movies, you know? 
It's, that's so true. Why are you doing this to me? Why are you beating me up? Why are you doing this? Hey, it's not personal. I had this vendetta against the world. If you have a child that has rage, you better take that very seriously. And so Chuck is reading this because when you stutter, you want to stay away from everyone because everybody's bad. And so Jesus takes him away from everyone. You're not going to read this in a commentary because the author of the commentary may not have lived this. But I did. What's in the Bible is a commentary enough of your life and mine. And so he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears. Jesus put his finger in the man's ears. And Jesus spat and touched his tongue. Jesus Jesus put his finger in his ears, then Jesus spit on his fingers and then touched the man's tongue. She said, this is weird. It is weird, but if you know where the region of this is taking place, that's what the physicians did in those days. They believed spittle from either a human or an animal was medicinal. And if they were going to heal your hearing or your tongue or your boo-boo, they would spit and rub it in. They believed it was medicinal. It's not medicinal, but Jesus is communicating to this man I'm working on you. I'm going to work on you. This is where we begin. You can't hear. You can't speak. Okay? Verse 34, then looking up to heaven, Jesus did, he sighed. The word in Greek is his shoulders went very high. He went like this. It's, it's, it's exaggerated. It's an exaggerated movement. If the guy can't hear you, do you see what Jesus is doing? It's like a mime. Jesus is showing him that he's grieved over the man's condition. Are you getting this? Yes. None of you are exempt from his love. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Epaphatha. Oh, that's the native tongue of where the man's from. That is, be opened. He spoke in Aramaic. He didn't speak Greek or Hebrew. Jesus spoke in Aramaic. If the guy was Russian, he would have spoken Russian or Slavic to him. Do you understand that? But you say, wait, ah, I found something wrong in the Bible. The man's deaf, and Jesus spoke to him. Yeah, the reason why he spoke to him is because when he spoke to him in the man's own language, the guy probably read his lips. Can you imagine this man's doing this? And he's telling you by what he's doing, he's, he's a doctor. That's who he is. This man's a physician. Because this is what our doctors do. He's trying to tell me he's going to fix my ears and my tongue. What's, what is the guy thinking? He's probably thinking, I've had this done a hundred times. Jesus exaggerates the sigh, looks at him and says, Epapatha that is be opened, and immediately his ears were opened and the impediment of his tongue was loosed. The word impediment, the chain, it means the chain was broken. Imagine your tongue twisted to its black with a chain twisted around your tongue. Be loosed. What does it say? The man spoke. The word means articulately or with logic. He spoke clearly. You could understand what the man was saying beautifully, perfectly. He spoke plainly. Then Jesus commanded them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. I call that holy disobedience. <laughs> And when, or and, sorry, verse 37, and they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Amen. So God did that to me in a 1983. Married, found Jesus, Jesus found me in 77. Lisa and I were married in 79. 
in 1983, in one night, uh, God touched my tongue, and it was a terrifying moment. And you can all stand, because you've been sitting forever, and we all got to go. Um, Lisa and, and the group that we hung out with on Saturday nights at Costa Mesa, they would go share the Lord on Lido Island, Babel Island, all Huntington, everywhere. And so, and this particular night, we were in Lido Island, and ev- everybody's out sharing, but I stuttered so bad that I would just walk, and I would pray silently for them. I would just pray. And if you've been to Lido, there's those foot bridges that, uh, that go over the waterways. And there was a woman sitting underneath one of the, the lights, the uh, light poles. And I was praying, and I heard, I didn't hear any voice but my own voice, but I heard this, which was not my, my voice thinking, is go and tell her about me. Well, believe me, that's not me. And... It was so clear that it was him speaking, but it's, but it's your voice. You hear your voice, but it's definitely not your usage of words. And I went over and I said, excuse me. She looked up. I said, would you mind if I told you about Jesus Christ? And she goes, not at all. Sat down, talked with her about the Lord, prayed with her, went and found Lisa and everybody. And I said, I just shared the gospel with this woman. We prayed and I didn't stutter once. And Lisa's like this. Lisa goes, and you're not stuttering now. And that, that's my story. That's one of my testimonies. Guess what? You have many more. You have many more because it all comes down to what you're going to focus on. You focus on what good he's done in your life. And Watch, you will be galvanizing yourself against Satan's tactics to pull you away. More than ever, church, it's time to just get on and hang on to him because he's certainly hanging on to you. Father, thank you. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.